Good morning, everyone. And as promised, here we are. I'm Jill. And I'm Phil. And we're here to introduce our adventurous Advent course to you. <laughs> but, but before we get into doing this most adventurous Advent course, uh, we're going to recap on our legendary Lent course uh, that we did in three parts last year. Um, where we discussed three practices that help us develop and grow as Christians. Every Christian is a learner, uh, but uh, Phil is in a particularly unique and vulnerable situation because uh, he's our curate, which means in um, a person's terms, he's our baby vicar. Yeah, learner plates. Um, which I also wear, by the way, as a way of recapping our legendary Lent course, uh, we're going to discover how much Phil learnt and remembered. But he, he promised me he's not looked at our notes. And uh, while we're going through it, if you were on that course, you can test your own knowledge. And if you weren't, maybe you'll learn a thing or two. So every session had a particular format and every session began with an activity. So uh, Phil, can you remember what the activity was for week one? Week one. So just to remind everybody, it is now November and this was, <laughs> was it February? like this um every march time every march time so i think it was a word puzzle i gave people to try and spot books of the bible in a piece of writing i think absolutely right amazing We had a video. Can you remember what the video was for that first week, Phil? That's the problem where they start to merge into one now. Um, was it the advert for, I want to say, beer with the, the boat, the American boat? The, Uh, um, signalling this other boat to get out of the way and then it turns out the other boat was a lighthouse. I do remember that but that wasn't it. That wasn't it. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite a good one. Uh, but it wasn't that one. No. I wonder what week that one was then. <laughs> yeah I'm wondering now. Maybe it was part of the teaching and not the intro. Is something about oh oh yeah I remember <laughs> it was um the couple and she's got a nail in her head yeah and she wants to talk about how she's feeling and yes. he's like take the nail out of the head yes yeah. it's not uh, about the nail yeah so um can you remember what the purpose of showing that video was No. Uh, so I believe it was dwelling in the word was the f was the first spiritual discipline, and so the game was to get people thinking about the Bible. The nail in the head was teaching us to to listen. Yes. <laughs> okay and then taking it a little bit further um what is dwelling in the word can you sum it up 
so dwelling in the word is about um, taking time out with the Bible um, to let the Bible, God's word, speak to us. And it's a particular um, it's a particular way of doing this that we call dwelling in the word, which is a, a group activity. Um, so we all read a passage together, um, think about it, and then we split into pairs and we tell each other what struck us about the passage. Um, and then we go together with another pair and explain to that other pair what the other person explained to us. Um, and then the four of us report back to everyone else. Yeah, so it's a way of listening to both God and to other people. And it's a really important discipline because um, so often we, we, we want to interject our own opinion and our own views and our own understanding. But dwelling in the word is about trying to have an ear open to what God might want be wanting to help us understand and then listening to the other person and listening to them so much that we can remember what they said to us, <laughs> which is so hard because we know we're going to have to share in a minute and what we're going to say. Now we're going to go a little deeper into dwelling in the word and uh, this spiritual practice that um, we're called really to engage in whenever there's two or three of us gathered together before we do anything else. Um, but I want to say, first of all, because some people might be watching this and thinking, um, mm, but we're not really learning. Um, uh, it, uh, wanting a Bible study from it. Well, it's not a Bible study as such. It's a sort of interaction with God and with others. Um, so if, if you want the background and the cultural and the historical context, that's not what dwelling in the word is all about. And indeed, it, there is a danger that sometimes it can take scripture out of context. Also, the practice of dwelling in the word, word won't resolve issues or uh, conflicts or answer problems or questions. It's just what we do in this present time. Um, and if when we do it, say, in a, a church service, which we have occasionally done, um, I personally think we always need to follow that up with a little bit of context and uh, with a preach and just, you know, try to endorse what God might be saying to us through that passage. What do you think about that, Phil? Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I'm just going to be my qu contrary self, as I normally am um, at 10 o'clock in the week when I'm doing our reflections. Um, so just to say that uh, I agree, uh, dwelling in the word is, none of, is not those things um, that you've just said. Uh, but that doesn't mean those things you've just said aren't important. Um, I think we do need uh, to be setting aside time um, as individuals and as um, a community to read the Bible a bit more sort of systematically and going that bit deeper into what it's saying in the context and all that kind of stuff. And we need to be uh, praying and following all sorts of other kind of spiritual disciplines like that. Um, so I think dwelling in the word is a great um, great thing to do is we'll come on to some of the reasons in a moment uh, but it's part of a balanced diet it's part of something we do alongside other things and um, to give us that whole holistic view of what god is saying to us at any one time hmm. 
the benefits, the good things about dwelling in the ver word is that anyone can do it. In one of our services, we had um, an eight year old who engaged with her granny doing it. And, you know, nobody is excluded. So whoever you are, whatever your knowledge, you don't need to know anything about the Bible to practice dwelling in the word. Um, so it can engage anyone in their faith journey. So, you know, you, you don't have to say you're a Christian. You don't have to be a Christian in order to engage with the, the the text and it's also good for folks of all intellectual capabilities as well um, and because we're listening to one another it helps us to engage and get to know one another a little bit better as well as considering what God might be saying and it's sort of that encounter with God which is very simple and accessible so when we're reading the particular passage passage we've chosen all we're asking ourselves is we our ears are sort of a bit alert to oh what word or phrase is especially striking us as we're reading this passage and that's it really just noting you know um, if we have other thoughts, like we might see a particular word repeated in the passage, or there might be something you've been, you have been thinking about, and it just jumps out at you when you look at it. Um, and I also think, because the expectation is that we're going to hear something, or there is going to be a word that jumps out, I mean, it's not all pretty, you know, some words, you know, might really challenge or provoke us. Um, but it arouses a spiritual curiosity um, and there is nothing to stop us going deeper and doing the further study that might satisfy that curiosity. And over time, once we get used to, to doing um, dwelling in the world, word, it helps to root us as a community of God. If, if all the church in their different meetings are always meeting with the same passage uh, at a particular time and looking at it and uh, discerning what God might be saying and listening to one another which just the value of that can't be underestimated um, then it helps to root us in the direction that God might be taking us in or is taking us in and it gives us confidence confidence to speak out and to know that you know what I was given is just as valuable as what the other person was given. So I think those are hugely positive benefits. And then over time, it builds anticipation. It's like, oh, well, what is God going to say to us as a group today? Um, any thoughts on that, Phil? Yeah, I just echo those. And I'm just thinking of the last two times I've done Dwelling in the Word, um, in St Catharines in the last week or so. Um, uh, so I we did it uh, with the youth group. We've got a Bible study group that meets on a Thursday afternoon um, and we, we did a little uh, session based on some of the elements of dwelling on the word and it was just such an amazing experience to see these teenagers who are they're, they're really they're, they're at the start of their lives, at the start of that journey that they're, they're going to have with Christ that's going to go on uh, for the rest of their lives. Um, and we, it was a tool they could use to engage with the Bible and start um, taking baby steps to read the Bible and get something out of it. So that was really exciting for those kind of at the start of their journey. Um, and the second time I can think of using it recently uh, was at a meeting uh, we were at. It was a, people that were further on in their journey, um, if you like. And uh, there were six or seven of us there and we were reading a passage from Acts chapter six. And of the six or seven of us, I think at least six of us all found our attention lingering on either Acts 6 verse 1 or Acts 6 verse 7, um, which was really exciting. There was a, an agreement on what we were being drawn to and then that shaped uh, the rest of the meeting and that kind of played out in the meeting. So actually God's word was directing the meeting and where the meeting was going because we had started uh, by dwelling in the word and because there'd been a communal discernment of which verses God was drawing us to. 
Which is immensely exciting, isn't it? And encouraging and strengthening. It strengthens our faith as well. So dwelling in the word isn't at all hard, but it does take practice. Can you remember what um, activity we did for week two? Was that Where's Wally? I think it was. I <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Fun little exercise, wasn't it? And it brought everyone together in the, the um, job of searching for Wally. And then, um, and then we showed another video to introduce the session. Can you remember what that video was? I'm trying to think, well, I couldn't remember actually. I'm, I'm confessing that. I don't know if anyone watching can remember. So I think it was a music video. I think it was, um, I got a praise by the beautiful South. Ah, uh, okay. Which has the lyrics, I got a worship, I got a praise. Um, and in the video um, that goes with it, you've got this woman in a lady's prison um, and she's presented with this golden uh, microphone and she, she starts a band in prison and it's all very feel good as she's visited by the vicar. How could I have forgotten that? Because it really had an impact on me. I thought it was a fantastic video. So if you haven't watched it, everybody, uh, Beautiful South, I Got a Praise. Um, and there was so much story in that. Um, yeah, I absolutely loved it. It sort of had me in tears because it was such good news at the end. Um, and it was such a positive uh, outcome. Why do you think we showed it though? So I believe the second uh, discipline was noticing. Is that right? Uh, well, uh, yeah. Or, right, oh, um, it is noticing. noticing, but we have a fancy way of saying it. Uh, I can't remember the fancy, fancy way. It's not that it's just got um, one consonant more than the first discipline. Oh, dwelling in the world. <laughs> <laughs> dwelling in the world. In the world. <laughs> It's all about seeing what God is doing all around us. Yeah. So it's, it absolutely is noticing. In fact, that's a much simpler way of saying it, isn't it? Dwelling in the world sounds a bit pompous, really. But um, it, it's, yeah, dwelling in the, the world and noticing where God is at, at work. Yeah, because yeah, I think, yeah, because I think from the video, I think, because you spotted it more in the video than I did, and I suggested the video, but it was the, the vicar notices this woman and presents her with the microphone, so he notices um, her gift and enables her to embrace it. <laughs> so now I'm going to dispel uh, an image that we like to project um, in these videos. Um, Jill and I very rarely manage to do the whole of a video in one take, um, and that is the case today. So since our last take, um, I've actually revisited my notes uh, from the first three weeks. And I've discovered uh, that week two, Dwelling in the World, actually the video for that was the lighthouse um, sketch that I mentioned earlier. And the Beautiful South video was actually something extra that we did as part of the biblical teaching um, towards the end of the session. Um, so the, the video was in it. Oh, Jill's putting her hand up. Uh, if I'd been on the ball, I would have noticed that, wouldn't I? So. No judgment though, no, ju no judgment in, in, in this video anyway. Um, so yeah, so, the, um, so I'm gonna have a little chat about the reason that we put um, that Beautiful South video in, uh, because the reason I picked out that video um, 
was because when I looked at the video and I read Ecclesiastes, uh, which has that famous verse, God has put the eternity in the hearts of men. Um, I saw that actually this uh, beautiful South song was actually articulating a lot of the stuff that that Ecclesiastes passage um, was articulating. And it made me think that actually maybe there's some stuff out there in the secular world outside church, which is actually reflecting kind of biblical truth back to us. Um, so the, the discipline of dwelling in the world um, is actually about having your eyes open and being on the lookout uh, for what God might be doing outside um, that can inform us um, about what he's doing and what we should be doing. Uh, so Jill, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's all about noticing uh, what God is doing. So, you know, for example, if you're out walking and you bump into someone, you know, three times in a week, um, I think as a Christian, you have to ask yourself, mm, what's God wanting to me to do here? You know, and should I be especially listening to that other person, engaging with them and seeing, you know, what, where we should go together on our journey of faith in, in some way. Um, of course, it's not always going to be uh, overtly obvious. Um, but the, the thing about dwelling in the world is that God is, is active in the world. God created the world good. He loves the world and he is active in the world. And it's our role to see what he is doing in the world and to join in with it. Um, so often we think it's a bit of a battle, you know, bringing God into a situation. But but God's very often, well, I, he's, he's there. Um, of course, yeah, now we're getting a bit too deep. But there, there are places which are, are God-less. Um, it, it, but they're only God-less because people are totally ignoring what, what God wants of them I would say um so John 1 14 in the message he says the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood um you know Jesus came down from heaven and entered our world uh, the question is can we only find him in the church is that the only place that God works in the church and these are profound questions that we've we've got to work at now um, because over the years, the church has become less and less relevant. You know, there's less people going to church than there were 50 years ago, for instance. And, um, but I believe in the church, you know, I'm a Christian. The church is the body of Christ. It's the believers of Christ. And it's good to meet together and worship together and pray together and discern God's will for us. Uh, but that doesn't mean he's not active in the world. Of course he is. And he's active in people in the world. Uh, but so often we don't look for it. This is, I'm, I am going off on one now, aren't I? But I think, you know, when we go through crises or, or difficulties, um, we might be more inclined to pray more earnestly. And then we do see God deliver. He puts people our way who help us and look after us. And um, that has been my experience anyway. Um, but we need to be aware of that when we're not in crisis or going through difficulty. We should be acknowledging God acting in the world in, in, in every situation we find ourselves in. Yeah, and I think that's really important because I think it really is at the heart of our faith, isn't it? And I think when we look at the gospel accounts of Jesus' death on the cross, mm. uh, there's one of them, sorry, terrible curate, can't remember which of the four. One of them talks about the temple in the curtain being ripped from the top to bottom. Um, and that was an allusion to the fact that before Christ died, the belief was that God was in the Holy of Holies, was in the center of the temple, and that's the only place God was, and that was where you went to meet with God. And actually, when Jesus dies on the cross, he rips that open, and the Holy Spirit comes to dwell um, amongst his people out in the world. Um, that's actually the heart, that's why Jesus died, so that the Holy Spirit can live with us. Um, so I think it's really important, this discipline, because it is about fighting that inclination we have to try and stitch the curtain back up and put God Ooh. back in his box in the church, where it's actually God's bigger uh, than the church. Um, 
So and, yeah, it's a really challenging one. Yeah, and there's loads of people um, who wouldn't call themselves Christians who really want to make a difference in the world, you know. And we we think that um, well, we we might put up a sort of I don't know veil or boundary and just say yes, but if you're not a Christian, you can't do things our way, and that that's not not what we should be doing. We should be saying. Can we help you accomplish this wonderful thing you are doing in the world to make the world a better place for everybody? Um, so we participate with other people who won't necessarily share our beliefs, but they share that image of godness within them that wants to be good and working for good in the world like God created them to do. Um, so we appreciate them and they appreciate us and we gel in a natural sort of way. And, you know, in time, we get the opportunity to share wh why we do what we do. The whole po point about it is noticing again so we've done dwelling in the word which is noticing what god's saying to us through his word but now this is another step dwelling in the world and noticing what he's doing outside of us and um, noticing for a reason because he wants to lead us into some sort of action So the question of dwelling in the wo world is, um, where is God working? And we can take that more personally and say, where is God working in my life? For example, where am I well established? Where are the green shoots, the new things um, cropping up? Where are things flowering? What is dying? Um, who or what are the cross-pollinators between different groups or organisations I belong to, uh, which complement different aspects of my life? And what is God doing in the community that I am part of? Those are the dwelling in the world questions we can ask ourselves. Okay, uh, right, we'll just look at the intro to week three now. Can you remember this? I'm, I'm mm. looking at, oh, I know what that was. Yeah, that was quite funny. And it was right up your street. Oh, uh, yeah, I, it was blob people, wasn't it? Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, if, if you don't, if you haven't been in a session with me yet, I'm nine times out of ten, I will produce blob people um, and make you colour them in. Um, so I made everybody colour in blob people, then cut them out and make big welcome banners um, out of blob people. And everyone enjoyed doing that, didn't they? In fact, they didn't really want us to interrupt them with the teaching. They liked doing the, the welcome banners, I think. Yeah, yeah I think we did so. interrupt them, didn't we? Because we, we had did. some stuff to share. So can you remember? Ah, now this was yeah interesting. What the video was. Yeah, I can remember this very clearly because it scars onto my subconscious. Um, so we showed a clip from um, uh, a comedy sketch show called The Mitchell and Webb Look, um, which I think it's fair to say split the audience <laughs> in, in terms of their reaction. Um, but the video was about um, a man walking into a suit shop and then the suit... Uh, the guy behind the counter is just so completely obnoxious um, that he is rude to him and makes him feel inadequate and bends him into picking out the suit that the shopkeeper wants to sell rather than the one he actually came in for. Brilliant. Well remembered, Phil. So why did we show it, Phil? Uh, I believe, I think, uh, Hospitality was the title for that week. Um, 
And so the video was a prime example of what not to do uh, when you're trying to extend hospitality to someone. So uh, our third topic was hospitality, wasn't it? It, and I think we couldn't do worse than to start with a quote from Hebrews 13, verse 1 to 2. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Um, how good are you at hospitality? Um, many of us might think it's about uh, just inviting people in for a cuppa and, and part of it is about that but it's also about this attitude of the mind and releasing of the heart and approaching strangers as friends. Um, someone once said uh, every stranger is a friend and no every stranger is a friend until you get to know them. Uh, can you remember what it was? Every stranger is a friend waiting to have Um, so we've got more to say on hospitality, but Phil has got this fantastic song and he wants to share the lyrics with you. Uh, so this, uh, there's a song, this is a song called Wide Eyed by Nicole Nordman. Um, and the lyrics go like this. When I met him on a sidewalk, he was preaching to a mailbox down on 16th Avenue. And he told me he was Jesus, sent from Jupiter to free us with a bottle of tequila and one shoe. He raged about repentance. He finished every sentence with a promise that the end was close at hand. I didn't even try to understand. He left me wide-eyed in disbelief and disillusion. I was tongue-tied, drawn by my conclusions. So I turned and I walked away and I laughed at what he had to say, then casually dismissed him as a fraud. I forgot he was created in the image of my God. When I met her in a bookstore, she was browsing on the first floor through a yoga magazine. And she told me in her past life, she was some plantation slave's wife. She had to figure out what that might mean. She believes the healing powers of her crystals can bring balance and new purpose to her life. Sounds nice. She left me wide-eyed in disbelief and disillusion. I was tongue-tied, drawn by my conclusions. So I turned and walked away and laughed at what she had to say, then casually dismissed her as a fraud. I forgot she was created in the image of my God. Not so long ago, a man from Galilee fed thousands with his bread and his theology, and the truth he spoke quickly became the joke of educated, self-inflated Pharisees like me. And they were wide-eyed in disbelief and disillusion. They were tongue-tied, drawn by their conclusions. Would I have turned and walked away and laughed at what he had to say and casually dismissed him as a fraud, unaware that I was staring at the image of my God. Oh, that's a powerful song. Who's it by? Nicole? Nicole Nordman. Nordman, yeah. Okay. Um, do you want to say anything about it, Phil? It is a real challenge, like especially especially when, if you read a lot of books and do <laughs> dwelling in the word and all this kind of stuff, and you're building up an informed knowledge of God and the Christian faith as, as we should be, it's a real challenge to actually put all of the stuff we know and the stuff we've learned to one side and just engage with someone who comes at it from a completely different angle, maybe without all the books that you've got, um, and to treat them with the respect um, of listening to them and taking them seriously. It's very easy to dismiss people as not having read the right books or thought the right things. Yeah. And I think, you know, Jesus calls us to love our neighbour as ourselves, which really is ever so radical. And it means that we open ourselves to others. So we live open lives, not closed lives. And Jesus did share plenty of meals and wine with others, 
but it was in a way which was out of keeping with the polite practices of the day, which even disturbed um, polite society. And I would say hospitality is always about personal encounter. It's about openness and welcome. It's about being available. So often we're not available, we're too busy. Um, and it's also about being vulnerable. Can you think of instances in the Bible when um, stories were shared of hospitality, Phil? Actually, you're not quite being on the spot. I had a little bit of notice for this. Um, <laughs> so I think uh, after Jesus' resurrection on the shore where he cooks breakfast uh, for the disciples that were out on the boat, uh, there's one. I think in the prodigal son, the father puts on a feast and a banquet for the son when he comes back. So that's um, hospitality. Um, um, interestingly, pretty well, didn't he? Yeah. Which is interestingly, there's that juxtaposition with the other son. Um, actually, that's yeah. worth looking at again. Um, okay. You've got um, Abraham entertaining um, people that turned out to be angels. Um, got Esther. She does a. Um, Esther does a meal for um, for the king and Haman, doesn't he? Doesn't she? Um... There's some very well known um, instances in the New Testament to do with lots and lots of people. Might you be referring to the feeding of the five thousand? <laughs> yes. um, and I'll, I'll have the feeding of the four thousand as a bonus there as well. <laughs> um, um, there's the wonderful story of a person who was rather short. Oh, Zacchaeus. Yeah. Yes. And Jesus got a lot of stick for going for, yeah. for yeah. dinner with Zacchaeus, didn't he? Tax collector. Um, there's the Simon the leper um, when they're all having a meal there. And um, the Last Supper, of course, you know, that that has to be the um, pinnacle of hospitality, doesn't it? Although, again, it was with Jesus's inner circle then, but we would hope when we share the Last Supper with others, all are welcome. Um, there's the story of Martha and Mary. Poor old Martha, she's working really hard and there's Mary sitting at Jesus' feet. Now, which one of them in that story is being hospitable. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting one, isn't that? It's a it, really difficult one. Um, it's, Martha doesn't cook the meal, they won't have anything to eat. It's one of those, those ones where you read the parable and you know what the right answer is meant to be, but you're kind of thinking the other one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then what about, um, this is this is an encounter with a stranger the samaritan woman at the well when jesus meets her and he asks her for for water doesn't doesn't he and uh, they start this conversation yeah and that's an, and that's another that's a really interesting one from a hospitality hospitality perspective isn't it because in the one sense jesus is really meeting her where she's at isn't he he's gone to the well and he's allowing her to serve to serve him but at the same time he's actually he challenges her doesn't he and he calls her out on um on something so there's that I mean, that's a good example of that balance between meeting people where they're at but holding true to yeah to how we're different but she also challenged him because she said you're a jew and i'm a samaritan you know you're a man i'm a woman why how dare you talk to me and ask me to put give you water and it's noonday all the disciples they've got gone off to get food for jesus and then when they come back with the food picnic whatever and jesus says well i've got food that you know nothing about um and jesus isn't hungry for food but he is hungry to share um, who he is with, with uh, others in a way that they will take hold of and that will change their lives forever. Um, so 
Yeah, there's loads of other stories. I'm sure folks watching can think of a few as well. Um, can you remember the the game that we played? Uh, the speed dating. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to describe it or shall I describe it? Uh, <laughs> you've got those pretty... So from memory, um, we had a minute to kind of go around the room and uh, what was it? Saying hello in a different language, something, share something the other person wouldn't know about us and learn something about the other person. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. And I, I remember I... There was two minute limit and then if at the end of that, you'd asked all the questions, then you could share common interests that um, you weren't aware of between you, you know, to sort of try to discover if there was one. Sorry, that was it. It got progressively harder as you had, it had to be a different unknown fact about you each time, didn't it? You couldn't recycle the same one, so and quite a the sixth time. Language, yeah. Um, so it was wonderful, wasn't it? It was really good fun. But what what struck me in that, and there was how many of us? About 15, 16, or maybe less. 12, 13, I, I can't remember exactly, but, um, and we did two sessions, didn't we, every week, but um, folks who'd known each other for years discovered new information about each other in that two minute a directive uh, encounter. So we gave them the questions to ask and then they discovered new things about each other, which was tremendously exciting. And yet, and that's, because we get in the habit of not asking different stuff, of not being open to different stuff, we, we sort of, it's comfortable. So we don't need to know anything about anybody else really. Um, and even, well, I'm talking especially now in a church environment, you know, folks do like to sit in the same area of church, if not in the same sort of seats, and they need that comfortableness. And then afterwards, when we're having tea and coffee, invariably, you'll chat to the same people you talked to last week, um, because they're the ones you connect with. And intersecting that cycle of sort of habitual comfortableness takes a lot of nerve, actually, and to step out of uh, your habit and go to somebody who you don't normally talk to and talk to them. Uh, well, I think that's been hospitable and I think that's what God calls us to be. And we need to practice it. It, you know, I when I was a young girl, I was really very shy. You know, I would cross over the road um, rather than walk past somebody. I wouldn't speak to people. The first time I led prayers in church, my knees were literally quaking. But I, I just wanted, and the only reason I did it was because everybody's eyes would be shut. You know, people see me and think I'm really extrovert, but it's my faith that has made me extrovert. You know, I've had to step out and be in this role. Um, but naturally, I'm, I am quite um, an, an introverted person, but not with Jesus by my side. You know, he sort of forces me to engage with other people. I don't say force in a way that my hands are tied behind my back, but it's because I love God that I want to be outgoing and sociable. And I know other people are different. I'm not trying to say you know, you've got to be like me. Um, but we are called to reach out to other people and be hospitable. Um, Phil, another little test. Can you, um, <laughs> can you think of um, situations where Jesus found no hospitality or groups of people who um, weren't hospitable to him? So there's, when he went back to Nazareth, wasn't there? Uh, where they looked at him and said, oh, isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this Mary's son? Mm. Um, so there's that irony that she had no hospitality in the place that he grew up. Mm. Um, so there's that one. Um, could argue that actually with the Pharisees, a lot of them, he didn't get hospitality. Um, yeah, so he's plotting someone's execution is quite an extreme form of non-hospitality, but it is definitely counts, I think. Um, 
he warns his disciples about um, not receiving hospitality when he sends them out. So they shake the dust off your, oh, yeah. off your feet. That's a good one. Um, when he was born, he was <laughs> no hospitality. There wasn't any room for him at the inn. Um, and then there was no safety under Herod and he had to fly to Egypt. So, um, and of course, he didn't receive any hospital. Well, he did receive hospitality on the cross. They gave him the vinegar and um, hyssop, didn't they? And raised that to his mouth. Um, but he was dying on the cross at the time um, and received lots of ridicule and mercilessness. Every individual we meet can never be replaced. You know, they are utterly unique and individual, um, made in God's image. And every individual we meet has something to give to us and can receive from us. I think that's at the heart of hospitality. It's been a an interesting thing to catch up on now three spiritual practices hasn't it and we are trying to develop them and grow them and encourage everyone uh, in the church certainly but maybe outside of it as well to develop these practices And next week, we're going to be looking at the practice of announcing the kingdom. Um, so this is quite an interesting one. It will be slightly different format because we're not going to be remembering stuff. We're going to actually be introducing it. So I hope you've enjoyed this morning and I hope you'll join us again next Wednesday, 2nd of December for our first teaching in our adventurous Advent course. So it's goodbye from me. It's goodbye from me. Bye.